I wished I had the technical ability uh, to throw up a picture on the screen that I just had texted to me. Um, yeah, well, it would, it would, I'll be moving on by then. So yeah, 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 but anyway, uh, my youngest grandson over there, hold him up there, Chad, that, that's Brooks, all right, there he is. Uh, I, I have a picture, all right, and that kid can dance, man. I, I don't know where he got it from. He didn't get it from his granddad, uh, uh, grandpa, as he calls me, his mother, yeah, I guess his mother, but uh, they sent me a picture while we were singing that last song, and he had both hands, man, up in the air. He was... He was in the groove, all right, in that worship song, so that was exciting. I invite you to turn to the book of uh, Philippians. We're still there. Christmas story in the book of Philippians, chapter 2. We'll be reading a few verses in a couple of minutes. Perfect song for today's message. Today's message may be one of the most unusual or bizarre Christmas sermons you've ever heard in your life. Uh, yes, it is based on the Christmas story that is found in the Bible, but the illustration, the allegory that I'm going to be using today is one of my all-time favorite movies. It's probably, it, it, I'd have to sit and think about this long and hard, it, I'm pretty confident it's in my top five. All right, I'm confident it's in my top five. Uh, it's one of Mel Gibson's films. I think it was the second one he produced. It's called Braveheart. All right. Now, how many of you have seen Braveheart? Raise your hand. All right. Oh, that's good. Okay. How many? And it's okay. Eight o'clock service. We had about two people who had never seen Braveheart. So how many in this service, you've never seen the movie Braveheart yet? Okay. Maybe you'll want to go home and rent it after today. All right. Now, men, it's a, I will tell you, it's a men's movie. All right. Now, I know you ladies are saying, no, Mel Gibson's in it. It's a ladies' movie, all right? Uh, but, but it is a, it's, it's my dad's version of a John Wayne movie, all right? Uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's just a great movie. Uh, and I would have never, ever thought that I would be using it to illustrate the Christmas story. But there's a Christian author by the name of Steve Farrar. Some of you may have read some of his books. He has written books specifically for men, all right? Um, I, I mean, ladies, you can read them, but his target audience was Christian men. And I was uh, reading through one of them, and I came across his research on the movie Braveheart and the character of William Wallace. William Wallace was perhaps, and, and so I, I know we have about seven or eight folks who were born in England. I'm not going to be speaking favorably of the British in a few minutes, all right? That there was a little season of your history that wasn't so good, all right? Uh, but, but you're wonderful people. We, we, we're happy to have you with us, all right? You're our mother country. You just wouldn't turn us loose. <laughs> I'm digging a deeper hole, all right? Um, Anyway, William Wallace may be one of the greatest heroes of Scotland. I've never been to Scotland, but I understand there are statues of William Wallace uh, all over the country. In fact, the guy who wrote uh, the screen, yeah, yeah, for Braveheart, he, he's the one who wrote. He never did any research on William Wallace apart from he went to Scotland and he saw the statues and he was briefly told the story. And he went home and he said, that story needs to be a movie. And he wrote the script for the movie. And then afterwards, did the research. <laughs> and so there's a lot of liberties taken in the movie. But just a bit of background for those of you who haven't seen the movie. Uh, I found out that William Wallace really was a committed believer in Jesus Christ. He was a Christian. According to Steve Farrar in the book I read out of, the movie touched a little bit on his faith, but it diluted his Christianity by inserting a little immorality to make it better screen for the, for the, for the big screen. Farrar asserts that Wallace was a man whose faith was deep. It was well known that wherever he went, he would have a man named John Blair following him around. You see, John Blair was his personal chaplain, his mentor. Blair was the man who was credited with writing down the original story of William Wallace. Now the story revolves around the time when the king of Scotland had died, and he died without an heir, a successor to the throne. They had no leader. Sensing an opportunity, the king of England, that was Edward the Longshanks, he stepped into the turmoil of that time and he claimed Scotland 
for England. This was his tactic. He would buy off the Scottish nobles, all the big shots, the people who own land, and he would give them more land and bigger titles to get them on his side. William Wallace did not like that at all. You see, his father had been killed in fighting for freedom for Scotland. He was tired of the English raping and pillaging the Scots. Apparently, the English even killed his wife. So he rallied the common men of Scotland to fight against the well-trained and well-armed armies of England. You see, Wallace had a brave heart. Wallace, too, was offered land and titles, but he was not willing to be bought off by the nobles of England. He had integrity, and he loved freedom. For William Wallace, there was no higher goal than freedom for all of the people of Scotland. That bit of history, that bit of movie drama based on a real moment in time is a reflection of the original Christmas story. Listen to how Paul wrote it in Philippians 2, verses 6 through 8. You may turn there in your Bibles. Today I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation. Is anybody getting chilly in here? Okay, if you would just push the up button. It got too hot, so we turned a little bit of cool air on. And we're going to up it just a hair. The side, ones, the, the side ones are not on, just the inside ones. All right, thank you very much. This is the way it reads in the New Living Translation. Though he was God, referring to Jesus, he did not demand and cling to his rights as God. He made himself nothing. He took the humble position of a slave, and he came and appeared in human form. And in human form, he obediently humbled himself, not only to be born of a virgin and be a baby like you see behind me, but also to the dying of a criminal's death on a cross. You see, Jesus, whose very nature is God, he did not use his title as God or his rights as God or his nobility as God or all of his power of heaven that it was at his beck and call. Uh, he didn't use any of that. He humbled himself to do for you and me what we could never, ever do for ourselves. In fact, according to Luke chapter 4, just as the king of England attempted to buy off William Wallace, Satan attempted to buy off Jesus. In Luke chapter 4, it tells the story of where Jesus had fasted for 40 days in the wilderness. He hadn't eaten, he hadn't slept much for 40 days. Physically, he was probably at his weakest moment as a grown man. At his weakest moment, Satan took the opportunity to show up. And he took Jesus to the top of a pinnacle of a hill there. And I don't know how he did it. Somehow this cosmic video screen showed up. And Satan showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the earth at one time. And verse 5 says it like this in Luke 4. Then the devil took him and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to Jesus, I will give you the glory of these kingdoms, and I will give you authority over them. i got to pause here just a moment. I find this absolutely humorous. Okay, I find this. But, but it's illustrative of how you and I, humanity, often feels about power. We are often deluded by our own sense of power. I mean, haven't you seen a, a tyrant of a, of a small country think he can take on the world? I mean, look at key moments in history. Look what Hitler did. L look how far he got, but he was deluded. L look at what other people have done. Deluded by power. It's the same thing Satan is doing here. He, Satan is telling the one who created the world that all those kingdoms are on that Satan is showing to him. And he said, hey, if you will deny the Father and simply follow me, I'll give you all of this. You see, and what Jesus was coming to do was to snatch all of those who were in his kingdom away 
and bringing them into a kingdom not of darkness, but of light. The devil told him, I'll give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them because they are mine to give to anyone I please. Deluded, isn't he? I will give it all to you if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus, though feeling weak at that moment, after having gone without food for 40 days and could not be bought off, instead, Jesus chose to come alongside the poor, the victimized, the sinner. Jesus said, I have a brave heart. And he humbled himself. And he came as a slave to show that God is not against humanity, but plans to lead us, to rise us up against the tyrants of darkness, the domains of what J.R. Tolkien said in his writings that he would call Mordor or Sauron our sin-filled imperfect world and take away the barrier between us as sinful people and a relationship with a holy God. Jesus said, I'll do this by offering myself as a ransom for many for the sins of the world. Just as William Wallace wanted freedom for all people of Scotland, Jesus Christ, when he came as a baby, our Savior, Jesus, wanted freedom for all people of this world. For our God hears the cries of those who are imprisoned and tortured and homeless and suffering. Kepler already referenced that today about his own life. And some of you, if you're new here, you didn't know that about the guy who so beautifully leads us in worship. Spent time in Folsom Prison. That's why his ministry is called From Folsom to Forgiven. God comes to transform us, whether we are in a prison cell or whether we sit in the penthouse suites. We are all lost. We are all struggling. Jesus comes. He is so moved with love and compassion, he was willing to leave all of heaven And come here and die for us. The darkness, the choices that humankind has made to make life work apart from God could not keep Jesus away. And so with the coming of the Christ child in the Christmas story, a brave heart is born. And his name is Jesus. As he grew up, he rallied apostles around him and they turned the world upside down. Jesus called fishermen and tax collectors. And he said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm going to digress just a moment for my my prepared message to tie in a little event from yesterday. How many men were at men's breakfast yesterday morning, 8 o'clock? Raise your hand. There was about 80 of us here yesterday. Was that not an awesome breakfast? Who man. I'm going to tell you what, the, the, the size of the crowd was bigger at the end of breakfast than at the beginning of breakfast. Because I watched most of y'all eat, all right? But, but, but it was really, really good. But not only was the food good, but the spiritual encouragement was exceptional. Doug Cecil, who led in the preparation of the men's breakfast, organized it, orchestrated it, directed it, he also shared his testimony. Doug Cecil is uh, one of the newest members of our church board. He's been serving a year now. Some of you know Doug's story. Some of you probably don't. Doug has a similar story to Tim Kepler's. Very similar. Spent time incarcerated. Was arrested multiple times. He, he, he told a brief story about he'd been out of town for a while after multiple arrests and brief incarcerations. He'd been out of town for a while and he, um, he came back to town, and he was in an alley, probably not up to much good. And he said there was a guy on a bike yelling at him to get out of his way. And so he jumped aside, and the guy went brisking by, and he said, and then here come two, two Fresno police officers chasing that guy. And as they're chasing that guy, they turned and looked at the guy who had jumped out of the way of the guy on the bike, and they stopped. And they looked at him and said, you're back in town? And they arrested him. <laughs> and they arrested him. Fresno police doing their best, all right? Taking care of it. And, and, and he said, but I'd, I'd live my life for myself. And uh, a, a friend invited him to church and invited him to New Hope. And he was at a, a place of struggle in his life. And he thought, well, I'll go. And he said, you know what? They're going to reject me. Those people at church, any church, are not going to want anything to do with me. I don't know how he thought we would all know he had been arrested. 
we don't usually know that unless you tell us. To just for any of our visitors who fill out a visitor card, we don't go to the internet and see if you have a record. I'm, I'm just telling you now, we, we, we don't do that, all right? I guess we could, but, but we've never done that. But he's a big guy, loves to ride a motorcycle, and he's got tats. He said, as soon as that church finds that out, they want nothing to do with me. He said, I came, and nobody said a word about my tats. He said, in fact, some wanted to check them out. He said, I came for a while, kept coming back, not because I really wanted to, but there was something that sort of kept drawing me. And he said, and then I thought, well, I'll sign up for a small group because if I'm going to get in this thing, I'm going to really commit and, and, and I'm going to go to a small group. But I bet when I get in that small group and they find out more about me, they're going to kick me out. And he said, wouldn't you know it, the small group they put me in was run by Fred Mendron. Fred Mendron spent over 20 years incarcerated in prison as well. He was part of an Aryan Brothers organization till he found Jesus, and then he was set free. Also in that small group was Della and her husband, Reggie. They've also spent a little time, both of them incarcerated, and there were two others. So in the small group he was in, five of them had all been to prison, and most of them had tattoos. <laughs> and then Cecil Spurlock was in there, and he rides a motorcycle. To my knowledge, our visitation pastor has not been incarcerated, um, <laughs> And I don't know of any tattoos, but um, I don't want to know about them either. But anyway, um, all that to tell you this. Doug Cecil shared his testimony of how he came to faith. He said three incredible things. Um, well, he said probably more than that, but I, I wrote three down. After he gave his life to Christ, which was several months after he started coming to New Hope, he said, I learned something. After I came to know Christ, I learned how to have a good time while doing the right thing. He said, up until then, I thought I had to do the wrong thing in order to have a good time. Number two, as we look out at others, and he was talking about when he was one of those others, and we were looking out at him. As we look out at others, we got to figure out how to get more of them in. Isn't that what Paul says when I'm going to be all things to all men that by some means I will win others to Christ? And number three, I love this one and it fits right where we are. When you cozy up to Jesus, the devil turns up the heat. And the devil did that to Jesus himself. At Jesus' weakest moment, Satan came and turned up the heat and he tempted him. But Jesus was a brave heart the world has never recovered from the arrival of Christ in the world. As we today can see with our own eyes, lives are still being changed, just like Doug Cecil's, by the brave heart of God. For this is Jesus' mission, that in his heart, this is the story of why we have Christmas. For Mary will give birth to a son, and they will give to him the name of Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will be with child and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, God with us. Now, because Jesus came as a brave heart, you and I today have choices. Shall we not only follow this brave heart of God, but shall we also become a brave heart of God? There was another character in the story of Braveheart. He was a young nobleman. His name was Robert the Bruce. Yeah, you've watched the movie. He was the logical successor to the throne of Scotland. He admired the courage and the passion of Wallace. Though Wallace, compared to him, was a common man, he was a noble. In a dialogue, listen to Wallace's response to Robert the Bruce. What does it mean to be noble? Your title gives you the right to the throne of our country, but people don't follow titles. They follow courage. Those words made an impact on Robert the Bruce. That was what made an impact also in the Christmas story. The courage of Jesus who did not stay in a cozy heaven but came and died, sacrificed himself on a cross so that you and I could be free. The Bible says in Galatians 5.1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundant. Jesus says, the truth will set you free and I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. 
And I'm available to anyone who will come and follow me. Jesus offers to us freedom from sin, its power and its consequences. He offers us freedom from ourselves. So rather than being self-destructive, we will be Christ-shaped and formed and developed. Freedom from Satan's influence. I don't have to do the wrong things in order to have a good time. And freedom from the consequences of hell. For now I can have eternity with God. But Robert the Bruce's father was dying of leprosy and he was hidden away in a castle tower. But he was devious. He was a treacherous nobleman. He reminds me of Satan himself. For him to preserve his power and his land for himself and for his family, he persuaded his son to betray Wallace. Wallace got arrested just as Jesus was arrested because of the betrayal of Judas. Wallace was arrested because of the betrayal of Robert the Bruce. I, I don't know, you probably remember, it's a classic part, classic scene in the movie, when with regret, Robert the Bruce says, I have nothing, and it's tearing me apart. I don't want to lose heart, and I will never be on the wrong side again. If you don't remember it, or if you never saw it, you can't say that now. Let's watch. I don't want to lose heart. I want to believe. I don't want to be on the wrong side again. Today, there is a God who made himself nothing in this Christmas story. Declaring to you that you are something. You are something worth dying for. And he died to pay our price of sin. Have you discovered that the things of this world don't matter so much after all? It's an old song we used to sing in the, in the church. We don't sing it much anymore. In fact, I couldn't tell you the last time we sang it. The things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. If you've run from God, but you find yourself here today, I don't believe in accidents. I believe it's the opportunity for you to say, I'm going to stop running from God. I'm going to stop pursuing titles and power and influence and personal pleasure. And I'm going to investigate a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm going to invite him to come live in my life today. The vast majority of you, I, I know you're committed followers of Jesus already. May I challenge you to keep reaffirming regularly your choice to follow the one whose heart is the bravest of all. For you are of great worth to God. You are worth so much that he died for you. Perhaps you were worried about things in this life. Perhaps you're trying to store up treasures here and hold on and accumulate things. May I suggest to you, start storing up treasures in heaven where you don't have to worry about moth or rust or thieves taking it from you, it will be there when you arrive. I, I've been watching the Amazon vehicles, man, delivering things up and down our street the last few weeks. The, I feel sorry for the Amazon drivers who've been showing up the last few nights around 7 and 8 o'clock. It's taking them a lot longer to deliver packages in those four blocks where we live right now. But you know what? It's a great sound, isn't it? The sound of a flushing toilet. <laughs> it's time for me to end, probably. But now I completely lost my train of thought. Yeah. But here's the deal, guys. I don't know what kind of delivery system that God has, but I know it's better than Amazon Prime. It will arrive to our appropriate residence in heaven, and it will be there when we arrive. We don't have to worry about a thing, and everything will be ready when that moment comes. So remember, the brave heart of God, this Christmas story, is Jesus. He came for us. 
If you don't know him, in a closing prayer, invite him into your life. No special formula, just the honest confession of your own heart. God, I need you. God, I want to trust you. God, I want you to provide for me the things I can never, ever do myself. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you so very much for your son, the Lord Jesus. Thank you for this time of year that gives us the opportunity to recalibrate, refocus in, in the midst of all the festivities of this delightful season, the, the birth of a baby. It also gives us time to reflect on the rest of the story, his life, his sacrifice, his death, and the greatest part of the story of all, his resurrection from the dead. A cradle without a cross is an empty story. It's a story with a sad ending. But a cradle that goes through the cross and ends at an empty tomb is a story worth telling. It is a story worth living. And so, Father, for a man or a woman, a young person who's here at this moment, and they've never invited Jesus Christ in their life, but, but they're saying, God, I don't think it's an accident you brought me here today. It's not an accident that Kepler said what he said. It's not an accident. Tim, the story of Doug Cecil, it's not an accident that I arrived fearful but I want to leave courageous. God, come live in me. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.